So it's my pleasure to introduce the first invited speaker, Andreas Geiger, who's currently a full professor at uh, the University of Tübingen and still associated with the Max Planck Institute, where before he uh, became a professor, was a group leader. And uh, I know him quite well from the one and a half years he spent at ETH and it was a pleasure working with him. He's always doing very cool stuff. So I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Andreas, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Torsten, for the introduction. Let me try to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Good. OK. So I'm happy to be here, even for virtually. And I'm going to talk about 3D controllable image synth synthesis, which is joint work with um, my postdoc e and my PhD students, Katja, Lars, and Michael. Oh, I need to close this window here. Otherwise, I don't see my screen. OK. Um, <clears throat> so as we all know, SLAM system, there, there's two dominating paradigms to SLAM systems. There's the indirect approaches that take a set of images, extract um, key points, and describe these key points, and then match them in order to minimize reprojection errors for either tracking the agent or incrementally building a map or estimating the 3D landmark locations. And there are direct approaches um, that take the set of images and try to directly minimize some photometric reconstruction loss in order to track the agent or to, for instance, estimate a per pixel depth um, from these measurements. Now, one work that I particularly like is already um, also seven years old, uh, is SLAM++ from Andrew Davison's group, um, where they uh, took uh, a, a simultaneous localization mapping to the object level, where we try to find an object level description of the scene, um, which has the potential to um, scale to potentially much larger scenes and compress the representation much further. Now, all the current SLAM systems, I would argue, are mostly discriminative. Um, they are relatively large, uh, sophisticated pipelines with many components, such as feature detection, robust matching, uh, loop closure detection, mapping, and so forth. And many of these components are either hand engineered or learned on independent uh, loss functions. So the question I want to raise in this talk, can we also think about a generative model for SLAM, a model that directly learns the observation manifolds, being that images or LIDAR points, where basically no supervision or annotations are required. For instance, in the SLAM++ system that I've shown in the previous slides, all the 3D objects had to be previously scanned um, using Kinect Fusion. And there's an object detector that has to be trained on a big label data set. So can we build a generative model that can be trained without such supervision? And uh, that captures the uncertainty in the data, which is useful on its own, but also, for instance, for completing missing parts of the scene. But the challenging question here is, well, how can we actually disentangle the underlying 3D factors that give rise to the image generation in a completely unsupervised or self-supervised manner? That's uh, certainly a difficult task. And we are trying to do some baby steps in, in these directions here in this work. And that's what we refer to as 3D controllable image synthesis. We want to build a generative model of uh, images that is trained based only on images, but in essence is 3D controllable, where we have access to all the 3D quantities that we'd like to manipulate, such as the pose of the camera. So here's a brief overview of the goal and where we could where this could be useful. So uh, such an image synthesis model takes a description of the scene that includes the pose, but also other parameters like the appearance uh, and the object um, geometry and it generates an image. I mean, this is an image from a real simulator. This is not an image from our simulation. Um, so as you will see, we are, we are far from that. But that's the ultimate goal. And this can be used then um, for simulation or for training or for ver verification, which is very important, of course, for any intelligent system. But it can also be used um, in a Bayesian setting 
to infer quantities, latent quantities of interest given an image as input, such as the pose, which then becomes useful for pose estimation or localization. So here is a brief overview of how we define this term of 3D controllable image synthesis. We want to learn a generative model where we basically have a latent distribution and we can sample images from that. So it's a generative image model. But where the underlying factors here are 3D controllable, where we have access, explicit access to the object shape, the object pose parameters, the object appearance parameters, such as the texture or the camera viewpoint. And we want to learn this from 2D observations, which do not require any pose information. So just a collection of 2D images. And we don't uh, require any supervision, no poses, no segmentation, no depth maps, uh, nothing. So let's have a look at some generative models. The traditional rendering pipeline maybe serves as the most basic generative model where we have a 3D designer that invents some 3D models and that get then rendered using a physically based render into an image. But the nice thing about this approach is that of course the 3D factors, they are designed, so they are by design controllable. However, it's of course not scalable. So it's expensive to create this content. Then um, we have classical GAN-based models, image GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks that take a random code and in an unsupervised fashion produce a model that can generate images from that random code. So these in contrast um, are unsupervised, so you can learn in an unsupervised fashion from 2D images, but the 3D factors are not fully disentangled. Right? So there are some works that look at disentanglement of factors, but they are not fully 3D um, disentangles. And the reason for this is that this relatively naive 2D convolutional network that's typically used um, for the image generation process, this naive architecture needs to learn all the aspects of the image formation process. For instance, perspective projection, which is something that we actually know something about. So we should incorporate this into the image generation pipeline. That's our hypothesis here. And this gives rise to our approach where we have a random sample that's fed into a 3D generator that generates a set of 3D primitives that are then rendered onto the uh, image plane in terms of feature maps. And then we have another 2D generator. So both of these are trainable models um, that uh, then uh, give rise to individual images that correspond to these objects that can be stitched together into a coherent description of the scene. And then this entire model, we wanna train end to end. Now in this model, the 3D factors can be controlled because we have this explicit intermediate representation that is actually 3D. Um, and we can also learn it in an unsupervised way from 2D image, just as 2D generative adversarial networks. Yeah, so the key idea here really is to jointly model in 3D and 2D space. Here's a overview of our model, which is actually a paper that we present here at this conference. So um, I will walk you through all of these. It looks quite complex. I'll walk you through all of these steps now in succession. So let's start at the left side here. So we have a latent code that's drawn from some standard Gaussian distribution and that's decoded into different quantities. So we have a certain number of foreground objects that we decode this into. So we have a common backbone and then shallow heads that decode into the parameters of these foreground objects. And then we have one object that's modeling the background. And so here you can see um, the formal notation of these primitives, O1 to ON are the foreground objects and OBG is the background object. And then each of these primitives is rep represented by um, 3D parameters such as the rotation and translation and scale of that primitive and appearance parameters that implicitly determine the appearance that will later be rendered onto the image. Then in the second step, we have a differentiable rendering part here where we render each of these primitives. I'm not going to specify these primitives now. Later in the experiments, I'm going to show which, which type of primitives we actually use. But ju ju let's just assume we have a, an abstract representation in terms of primitives that gives rise to a differentiable rendering of, in terms of its feature maps. So we render these um, onto the image and we get 
um, feature maps. This is the first column. Um, we also get alpha maps, which describe the spatial extent of these primitive, and we get depth maps. And then for the background object, we only get the feature maps. In, in this case, we use a sphere that we uh, look at from inside out, and this basically is kind of the environment map that we produce. So we don't have any alpha map or, or depth map here because it's seemed to be at infinity and, and cover everything that's not covered by the foreground objects. And then um, we have a 2D generator where now these 2D representations are processed with a set of 2D convolutional networks, basically units, that transform these representations into now here in the first column, the actual RGB pixel values. In the second column, refined alpha maps that adhere more closely to the actual shapes. As you can see here, this is more the alpha map of the primitive. Now here we have the alpha map of the actual shape. Um, and then also refines the depth maps. And we also have a 2D convolutional network that, I mean, all of these have shared weights that produces the uh, background image from the feature representation. And then we have a standard alpha composite composition step, which is also differentiable, that um, based on the depth ordering produces an image from these alpha maps and these RGB pixel values, as you can see here. In this model, we have multiple loss functions. So the most important loss function, of course, is we are working in an adversarial framework here, also like GANs, is this adversarial loss function. It's a standard adversarial loss with spectral normalization. Um, the only difference to a standard loss is that it has a little switch here, C. So it's also conditioned on C. And C determines if the image is ever a pure background image or if it's an image where, which contains background and foreground objects. In fact, we observed that if we just compare, if we would not have this, if we just compare the full images to the real images in our data set, um, then it would be easy for the model to integrate the appearance of the objects into the background component. Now to disentangle this, we generated a data set of real images with foreground objects and background and a set of only real background images. Now with this um, discriminator here that can be controlled using this flag C, we can now learn to disentangle using these two data sets, um, the foreground objects from the background objects. And then we have a, uh, a second loss function here, which is the compactness loss, which uh, is basically a regularizer on the size or the shape of the object. If we wouldn't have this, then objects could grow very large, which we want to avoid. We want to have the most compact representation that still produces a reasonable image. That's why we penalize basically the L1 norm of this um, alpha map here, which means that most of the pixels should actually be turned black. And then we have a uh, geometric loss that ensures uh, geometric consistency after the 2D conversion. Because we have this 3D to 2D uh, conversion and then another set of layers that produce from the feature ma maps actually the RGB pixels, it could be, and that's actually what happens, but we also observed that these 2D convolutions also um, contribute to the image formation process itself. So they, they manipulate slightly perspective. And that's of course not something that we that is desirable. So what we do here is we basically, um, because we have the 3D representation, we compare the uh, um, appearance that we obtain here to the appearance of an ins of the same instance that has been randomly rotated and translated. And we can do this because we also have the depth map. So we can do lookups through the depth map into the other viewpoint. We basically create a multi-view scenario. And uh, this loss function then penalizes the error, the multi-view reconstruction error, both in terms of the RGB pixel values and in terms of the depth values, which is um, a geometric loss. So here are the data sets that we're using for our experiments. We have this um, simple data set without backgrounds. Then we have a data set with simple backgrounds. And we have an indoor data set that's using real images from, or I think it's rendered images, but, but more realistic images from, from uh, indoor scenes. And we have these um, cut models from uh, ScanNet overlaid on top. And then here, uh, from ShapeNet, sorry. And here on the right, we created our own little data set using uh, synthetic fruit. Now here, everything is, is real. 
So let's look at the experimental results. We compare to uh, several baselines. The first baseline is layout to im, a recent work um, published at CVPR 2019, which shares uh, the idea with us, but does everything in a 2D domain. So the idea here is also that from a layout of bounding boxes, one can produce an actual image. And this is here modeled in a, such an autoencoder-like uh, fashion. Um, and in contrast to us, not only it is modeling entirely uh, the scene in 2D with 2D bounding boxes, but it also requires the 2D bounding boxes as supervision during training. And so we don't require 3D bounding boxes or the segmentations during training. Um, however, what we observe for this model is that if we now generate an image using this layout representation and then this remove this object here in the red rectangle um, across the screen, um, the object identity is not disentangled from the pose or from the 2D location actually because it's only a 2D model. So as you can see, as we translate the bounding box that should generate that car, the car identity flips completely from yellow to red to, to black. Right, so it's not consistent. Um, and that is something that happens consistently for this model. It's not something that the model actually penalizes because it just, all of these images look uh, realistic. It just looks for realistic images. It doesn't look for, for this consistency. Then we created a baseline from our approach where we remove the 3D layers and just use the 2D layers. So here, this generative part directly generates a, a set of 2D rectangles, so a 2D primitive representation that's then parsed with these um, 2D units into uh, similar feature maps as we had before. It's basically a, a 2D version of our model. And what we observe for this model is that, well, while it preserves the identity, it, um, uh, does, not, uh, con it does not disentangle rotation and translation, which is clear because we have just a pure 2D, um, a 2D model here. Okay, so it's a little bit of noise here outside. Let me quickly close the window. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, uh, so this is the results from our model. Here you can see what happens in our full model when we apply a, a 3D um, translation or a 3D rotation to the objects. As you can see now, this car here translates through the, through the scene realistically. And in this case, it rotates around it, its own axis. So we have full controllability over these uh, 3D factors. And also we can rotate the viewpoint or the camera here around the scene, as you see here, or we can lower the viewpoint as you see here. Um, there's also a little video. I hope this plays well. Um, so this is the first um, and first example from the layout to in baseline where you can say the identity switches on this simple car data set. And this is the result of our 2D baseline where you can see that the rotation cannot be controlled. Our, here's uh, the results of our full model where we can able translate objects. So these are four different instances, as you can see. So we translate in different directions. Uh, we can rotate the objects. We can rotate the camera around the scene. Or we can change the elevation of the camera. Here are some results on this flying furniture data set, which is much harder, of course, because the background appearance is much more complex. And here are some results on this fruit data set. I mentioned before that there's multiple options for this 3D primitive representations. And we consider in our experiments uh, several variants. So first of all, we consider a point cloud that's rendered onto the image using these Gaussian spheres that are projected onto the image. Um, here on the second column, you can see the alpha map color coded based on the three objects that we project. And you can see the final image reconstruction. We also compare a cuboid representation where we directly um, project the 3D cuboids of the primitives into the uh, image and uh, then in this feature map encode in the channels the different features. And then we have a sphere based representation where instead of these cuboids we um, model 3D spheres. We found that 
um, there is not a big difference in terms of the performance of these three different representations. What we can see here is the FID. This is the Frechet inception distance. So a lower score means higher image quality. And on top, you'll find the result of the uh, vanilla gun, the 2D gun approach. What we also have is the FIDT and FIDR measures, which are basically um, computed after random rotation and translation of the objects, which somehow measure the disentanglement capabilities of our model. And here, finally, the FIDI measure is the fresh air inception distance um, for single objects that are generated, which should also look um, close to rendered images of single objects, where you can see a slight improvement of the sphere-based representation. But in general, we have similar FID scores. So the precise form of the 3D representation seems to be less relevant than the general concept of joint 3D, 2D representation for this task. We also compared to a representation where we represent the entire scene now with a single primitive. We, we don't have multiple primitives, but try to represent the entire scene as a single primitive. And surprisingly, the FID score goes further down but of course we cannot represent individual objects anymore. Furthermore, we can see that now um, the number of objects is uh, entangled in the representation. So for instance, if we rotate the scene, then at, at this point here, the red car disappears. And what we also did uh, just as, a, as a, a simple benchmark is to use a textured mesh representation where we don't have the 2D convolutions, but directly project this mesh using a standard differentiable rendering techniques into the image domain and then learn the parameters of this mesh such that it produces realistic textures. And this leads to much worse FID scores, as you can see here, um, caused by the fact that meshes are just a very difficult representation for deep neural networks to output. I also want to show you some failure cases of this approach. Here you can see um, failure cases on two, the two most challenging data sets in our evaluation, the fruit and the flying furniture data set, where in the first case, if we move um, um, to, the, to the right here in 3D space, both these objects here move simultaneously and, and slightly change their shape. So multiple objects have now been represented by the same primitive. On the bottom, you can see um, um, the rotation of the camera, which causes this bench shape to um, change to a chair shape. So there's a little entanglement of object identities happening here. So what we were also wondering is, well, this, these results were nice, but they were pretty simplistic still. And what, what is needed to go to more realistic setups? Is there actually a better 3D representation for 3D controllable image synthesis? Going back to single objects first. And um, this is actually very new results. So one, um, famous work uh, from last year um, that um, also tackles this aspect of 3D controllability is Hologun, in this case for single objects, where the random code is uh, sampled and um, generates a 3D feature volume that is then rotated and projected, followed by 3D convolutions and 2D convolutions, which I call neural rendering here, in order to render an image. This gives relatively high fidelity images and leads to some disentanglement. But in our experiments, in particular for large viewpoint changes, it doesn't lead to consistent 3D models. And we quantify the consistency that we get by applying ColMap to the reconstructions of the model. So we, for the same appearance code, we generate multiple viewpoints. And then we ap apply a standard structure for motion and multi-view stereo pipeline to these results and see how the point cloud looks like. Another baseline that we consider for, for this work here is um, platonic gun, which is similar to hologun, except that it doesn't have any learnable uh, rendering part, but it tr directly tries to predict a colored 3D voxel representation followed by a differentiable rendering that has no learnable parameters. Now, because it doesn't have any learnable parameters in the rendering, it's multi-view consistent by definition. However, because this is just a very hard task, it leads to uh, low image fidelity and has a relatively high memory consumption. Therefore, also the reconstructions from the multi-view stereo algorithm don't look very compelling. 
And uh, so this is uh, the approach that we are proposing here. It's built on some recent model um, that has shown that neural radiant fields are actually a good representation for novel view synthesis. So we want to build here a generative model for these radiant fields. This is a continuous representation that's multi-view consistent and is able to, as we found in our exper uh, experiments, produce high image fidelity with relatively low memory consumption. The general idea is illustrated here. So again, we sample a random latent code, and then we have this radiance field that maps from a 3D location. So it's a neural network that maps from a 3D location and a relative viewpoint direction to a color value and a density value. And then we can use volumetric rendering techniques that don't have any trainable parameters, um, um, but, but they can evaluate basically this continuous density field at arbitrary resolution to yield images of arbitrary resolution. Now, if we do this and train this model, we can obtain um, results that are much higher fidelity, but also by definition, multi-view consistent as evidenced here by the Colmap reconstruction. So here is a brief overview of this approach. Um, because um, this is a continuous representation, we cannot uh, simply uh, sample all the pixels in the image that would just be too memory intensive. That's why we have what we call a patch generator and a patch discriminator, similar to a patch gun, but with dilated patch versions. The advantage of this is that the patch discriminator can be a standard 2D convolutional network, which is efficient, um, while the patch generator can generate these patches with ar uh, arbitrary dilation factors in order to reach better and better quality. In, in, in practice, we use patches of size 32 by 32 pixels, but sample random scales during training. So what goes into this generator here are the um, camera intrinsics, the extrinsics, as well as the scale parameter for this patch. And then depend, then this fully determines the 3D rays that correspond to the pixels that are active in this patch. And then for this ray, so this is this outer box R for rays, we can then um, sample these rays along the ray in this 3D space. So we get these 3D points that go into the radiance field that gives us for all of these 3D points that, course, that are lying on that ray um, for this particular shape and appearance latent code, a color value and a, a density value, which we can then render volumetrically onto the intensities or the color values actually of the pixels of the patch. And then we can compare this predicted patch to real patches that are sampled using the same sampling strategy from real images. So here are some results of this model. What you can see here on top is, um, images generated from cars where um, this model was trained in a fully unsupervised fashion on a car data set with unposed images. We also automatically obtain depth maps, which look quite, um, quite nice. You can see um, rotations of the model. You can see interpolations in shape and appearance space. It also works to some extent on faces. So you get quite, quite nice depth maps here. But still, you can see this, this common gun like artifacts. OK. So the question is what's next? Well, um, one thing we want to definitely do is we want to have this model operate in the real world. Most of the results that you've seen so far were um, produced using uh, synthetically generated images. Now, how can we lift this to the real world? And one particular project I want to, want to show you here at the end is a new data set that we are creating, where we are also going to apply these ideas now. And this is called the Kitty 360 data set. It's basically the successor of the Kitty data set for self-driving. The difference to the existing Kitty data set is that this data set has now semantic annotations in the form of 3D bounding boxes and per 3D point and pixel semantic information for all the frames. 
It's actually a data set that we have been working on for quite a while, um, since 2016. Um, but as you know, the last 10% often takes uh, most of the time. So we are just releasing this data set this summer. We have an overall driving distance of uh, 70 kilometers with uh, two frames of a forward facing camera actually and two frames of a fisheye camera. And then we have also a new laser scanner. So in addition to the Velodyne laser scanner, we have a push from laser scanner that gives us a bit of better coverage. Furthermore, we have everything geolocalized. So we have the, GP, the accurate GPS coordinate for all the frames. And then we have semantic labels consistent with the cityscape labels for 19 classes. And we have instance labels for buildings, vehicles, pedestrians, traffic signs, and other classes, which are importantly consistent across all frames of the sequence because we have labeled this in 3D. So here you can see some examples from this uh, data set. You can see a 3D point cloud here on the left. Um, some bounding boxes um, that we have annotated um, the corresponding semantics. So we have an algorithm that derives from these bounding boxes the semantics of the 3D points and uh, the pixels in the image, as well as the instance information. And here you can see how this projects into the image. And we also create, created a little teaser video, a little cinematic trailer, if you will, that I want to um, show you now. I hope it plays reasonably well through this uh, Zoom session. I hope you can hear the sound also. So we'll release this data set this summer, and I hope that this has also uh, it, it provides also as a valuable research for uh, resource for research in localization and mapping. So that's all from my side. I want to thank you for your attention. Um, also want to point out um, our blog page if you're interested in our research, and I want to thank our sponsors for supporting our research. Looking forward uh, to your questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Andreas. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit weird, right? It's tradition to do this, but it's it's, it's a bit like... weird if there's only one person. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, we we will see whether people uh, have questions on YouTube. There's a bit of a time delay, uh, but let me start with questions. Maybe um, I very much like this idea of of the radiance fields that you talked about. Um, one question is. How do you scale this up going from like small controlled scenes to, to urban scenes, something kitty-like? 
Do you have any yeah, ideas? That's, there? that's, I guess, really the question here. Um, <laughs> so I don't have a good answer to this. Um, yeah. One, one. Uh, I mean, first of all, these radiance fields are um, representing the appearance in 3D space using a very simple, fully convolutional, uh, fully connected network architecture, and that's not something that can scale up easily. So one thing that we have done recently is uh, we have um, proposed a convolutional version of these um, implicit representations that can scale to higher resolutions. And, and we think that this can also be helpful maybe for these radiance fields and not only for um, things like occupancy networks or um, sign distance fields. So that there will be something. Um, but then like building a generative model is, is always harder than building a discriminative model. So um, yeah, so that there will there will be, as you could see, like the, the results mm -hmm. that we obtain, even the results with these radiance fields models is, uh, is, is not on, on par yet with a discriminate version of it uh, that works on a lot of images and can produce, can produce very high uh, resolution uh, novel view synthesis results. Mm -hmm. Um, I was I was wondering whether maybe there's there's actually an answer from the computer graphics community who have been building like scene representations or data structures of scene representation for years, right? Whether we should go back to that. Yeah, that's interesting. I think like these representations that they are building are made typically for designers. So yeah, they are not so easy to work with from like a perspective of continuous latent space generative models. But um, I think there is exciting work along these lines also to build you know, recurrent networks or something that can maybe maybe uh, also build these type of models. Yes, but I, I think that's a good point. Yeah, we should probably look more into these, um, like what, what Pixar uses or Disney uses for, for creating their movies. Yeah. <clears throat> Do, do people on, on uh, YouTube actually, can they join this uh, Zoom or do they have mm. the option to chat or how does it work? Well, the, what they can do is they can ask questions through the chat and we will relay that to you then. Ah, okay, I see. I guess it's also pretty early <laughs> in US. <laughs> yes, uh, but um, we, we have a couple of questions. So uh, Jim asks, what does the ideal end goal look like? We want to be able to create scenarios with just textual descriptions. How about particular details like vehicle A overtaking vehicle B at time T? Oh yeah, that's a good point. So we haven't looked at time yet because just modeling space is so hard. <laughs> and for time, the problem is that even the data sets are missing, um, but we have some data sets. So for instance, we have Kala now where we could at least in simulation create a lot of uh, scenarios that are maybe good enough for these generative models. Um, so it's definitely something we are interested in and we'd like to do at some point. Um, and uh, the question is, what is the end goal? Yeah, so the end goal, like the ideal end goal for me would be um, to have a system that can like go, like a system like the kitty car that can, can be driven through the environment or an indoor system that can scan the environment um, that may be equipped with expensive sensors but that doesn't require any supervision in terms of annotations. And then there's an algorithm that builds a simulation, a simulator of the real world um, where you have space and time and where you can replay interesting scenarios so that you can validate and, and test and train intelligent systems. I think that would be the end goal and that you can maybe, uh, you know, if there is uh, situations um, that occur less rare in the real world, such as like in the case of self-driving where you have um, uh, like where you have uh, collisions more rarely uh, um, on, on video, then you could change your simulator such that these collisions happen more frequently and you have more observations of these rare events. Um, another question that came up is, do you have any thoughts on how these representations may be used in SLAM maps? What are the current limitations? Um, yeah, as, as I pointed out in the beginning, I think, I mean, this is, this is an interesting question. I think there's no definite answer to it. Um, as I shown in the beginning, I, I like very much these object level representations. And I think one fundamental uh, limitation of these approaches is that they require a lot of supervision in the form of scanning 3D objects and so on. So if you have a, 
a model that can automatically decompose scenes, I think that will be very valuable because you can, this can lead to very compressed maps, right? You don't need to store millions of local key point descriptors, but you can just store what's relevant. And you can, like, if you have objects that reoccur throughout the scene, like you're driving through a city, you have many houses that look alike or many cars that look alike, and that can be described by just a few bits uh, difference or you walk indoors where you have a, a, like, a, like a lecture hall with a lot of chairs that are all like each other, you need much less bits to actually represent that scene compared to um, representing that scene using an actual landmark based kind of classical slam map. That sounds great. Looking forward to the first slam systems that actually do this. Um, yeah, we are quite far from that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, that's why we do research, right? <laughs> to get there eventually. Um, one question regarding scaling radiance fields. So there are two big differences between networks trained on cars and foods and uh, networks trained on kitty. One is realism and complexity and the other one is resolution. Which one do you think is more difficult? Um, I think both of them are uh, like, a, I mean, <laughs> okay. So resolution, resolution is uh, in our case, is just uh, given by definition because we can just query the radiance field at any resolution, but that doesn't mean if you have a high resolution image, that doesn't mean that you get a lot of details, right? Which you probably refer to, would refer to by realism, right? So. I think um, the res resolution aspect, that's more a compute and memory aspect now. Um, but the real challenge is to in integrate the realism, in my opinion, because the real world is really complex and there's a, a fractal structure to it. And there's a lot of high frequency textures in the real world. And there's a lot of effects that are really hard to model like lens flares and transparency and smoke and hair. And there's a lot of these things um, that are just um, very difficult to model. And so, um, first of all, like just because we can model these cars doesn't mean we can go to more complex uh, image manifolds and, and the real world is much more complex. Um, and then uh, there's all these, these, these artifacts of the imaging pipeline that also need to be considered. So I think the realism is really the hard, uh, the hard nugget here and the rest will come with computation and, and better engineering of the models probably. Oh, <laughs> if I, uh, the chat says if I have time, I can go to, oh, this is after the talk. So there's yeah. a, there's a channel where we can continue yes. interacting. Okay. If you want. Um, so uh, one question is, uh, do you think it's simple to cover uh, domain shifts? I think that's a follow up on what you just said. Uh, for, for which part do you refer to now? Uh, that's not fully clear from, from the question, uh, Giovanni, <laughs> could you maybe, okay. uh, um, well, I mean, if you build a generative model, then the generative model is built for a certain domain and that's the domain that you cover. Right. Um, so there's no such thing as a domain shift in a generative model per se. Um, but domain shift is an important problem if you now want to like uh, use this generative model in order to um, train a downstream task in order to then apply it to the real world. But I think that's exactly where the benefit of this generative process is, right? So if you look at a lot of the simulators that people use um, for pre-training their models and then trying to deploy their models in the real world, they observe a huge domain gap. Now, if you would have a way of making these models more realistic by learning more data in a data-driven way, um, then you could potentially overcome some of this domain gap at least. That is at least the hope, I think, of these generative models, yes. Um, another question is uh, for the current Kitty odometry data sets, there are some time synchronization issues between IMU and Velodyne, which is only up to 10 hertz sync or so, uh, which is not suitable for multi-sensor based SLAM and VAO systems. Uh, for your new data set, uh, do you provide uh, high frequency synchronization 
of IMUTE uh, with image and uh, LiDAR data? Yes, that's a good point, actually. Um, so we have all that data and we should really provide it. I will just make a note that we also do. <laughs> um, yes, so we, 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 should, we should provide that. Um, the data on Kitty, I think, is not necessarily wrong. It's just low frequency and we uh, interpolate um, between the uh, timestamps, right? So we, we, we take the real timestamps and then they shift the measurements because there is no there is no synchronization um, per se. So the um, R RTK uh, measurement device is not synchronized. So the way the synchronization works in Kitty is that we have a little uh, read contact that reads when the laser scanner is in a certain position, and then when that read contact reads, and that's typically when the laser faces frontally, then the cameras trigger. So those are synchronized with the laser pointing in a particular direction. But then there is no possibility to synchronize this, at least if we hadn't, didn't have a, a possibility to synchronize this, this, this with the OXT uh, um, um, box. Um, so we need to rely on the computer for synchronization. So there might be still uh, small time gaps, but at least we can provide the, the original stream also with uh, the GPS timings of uh, what the OX provides. I mean, that's that's what we can do, but we don't have any, unfortunately, that's hardware limitation, right? We don't have any real like um, electric synchronization between the GPS and the LiDAR, unfortunately. Thanks. Uh, maybe one final question, which is the, the clarification of the, the domain gap question, which is uh, generating images is cool and very challenging but then systems have to work in the real world. How to, how to train on virtual data and then use it on real data? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's again, <laughs> that's, um, and that's the, the classical domain gap question. So I think um, this, you know, thinking a bit more abstractly about these generative models, um, generative models can also be seen as bridging the domain gap when you have already simulated data, right? So you wanna, we want to make this simulator more realistic, right? That's also one, one line of work um, is, is looking into that problem. And I find it very exciting. So for instance, you could take a simulator that has some assets where the textures are maybe not uh, photorealistic and maybe the arrangement is not photorealistic. But now you can uh, take what the designer has done and um, take um, reconstructions of the real world. For instance, the Kitty data set or some data set that we have uh, created and then um, try to match the distribution of that real data set to um, that synthetic data set or the distribution of the synthetic data set to the real data set, both in terms of the geometry um, and maybe time, the motion of the objects, as well as the appearance of the objects, right? So that, that's, that's maybe one way to go about it. And apart from this, of course, there's all this work on domain adaptation. My personal take on this is that there's still a lot uh, to be done in domain adaptation because um, uh, what we often see is that domain adaptation works well in the low data regime where we have maybe, you know, for, for downstream task, we have maybe 100 or 200 annotated images, then we can still outperform. Um, but as soon as we have 1,000 or 10,000 annotated images, um, then the current domain adaptation techniques are not, uh, not really helping that much. And that's really unfortunate because that's the domain where we're really interested in because for real problems, we often have the ability to annotate at least 1,000 images. And so I think there's a lot to be done. Yeah, thanks, great questions all. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. I think there are still much. a couple of questions. If you want to answer them on the YouTube yep, channel, then there. please look to, to go ahead. There were also some very enthusiastic re uh, reactions on the video for the new data set that you showed. Just wanted to let you know. Uh, but. Yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. Very much appreciated. Thanks,